just to give you a, a, a little bit um, on what, what's going to be happening today, it's basically the authentic integrated self and selflessness. Um, we do have another one um, happening the first Sunday in December and the first Sunday in January as well. I'll um, mention those topics at the end of class. We're so, so grateful and benefited by uh, Venerable Yunten's teachings. Um, and so I'm just so want to say thank you very much, Venerable Yunten, and please continue to teach here. And so I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Uh, thank you, Christina, and uh, welcome, folks. Today, we're talking about psychology and Buddhism, kind of parallels and paradoxes. And I think that it's an important conversation for us to have, even if we are not psychologists, even if we have never been to therapy. I think that therapy culture and psychology ideas pervade Western culture and a lot of Eastern culture as well. Um, and I think that there's also a lot of pop psychology out there interwoven with self-help books and also some kind of pop psychology that might be interwoven with Buddhism light, you know, where a book has some Buddhist ideas, some psychology ideas. It's not totally clear which is which, and they're all kind of jumbled together with the best of intentions to help people live happier lives. Um, but there are also some dangers and pitfalls in being too loosey-goosey about these things. So I thought we'd just kind of flesh it out. My family background has a lot of psychology influences. My dad's a therapist. And so I grew up with a lot of these ideas. And I work half the year in a postgraduate program with psychoanalysts. So I don't teach the psychoanalysts psychoanalysis. I teach them Buddhism. But we have lots of conversations about psychology and Buddhism and the parallels and paradoxes there. So the disclaimer is, is that I'm speaking from the Buddhist perspective and my impressions of psychology, not as an expert of psychology in any way. So disclaimer, and I apologize to any psychology scholars if I misrepresent you. Um, so when we're talking about these things, I think let's just take a minute and ask ourselves, what is the point? of psychology? What is the point of Buddhism? And are there parallels? I think the point is probably health and well-being. Yes, they're both techniques to facilitate health and well-being. And what we need to ask ourselves is health and well-being possible? <laughs> and to what end? Why do we want health and well-being? It, you know, it might seem self-evident, you know, being healthy and happy is nice, but how come? Like, for what purpose? Is that the only purpose of a human life to achieve physical health and mental well-being? Or is there something more than that, something more expansive than that? And which of these techniques is going to get us there? Or are both of them going to work in tandem? And I think these are the questions we want to ask ourselves. But I'm starting from the assumption that both of these schools of thought want to facilitate health and well-being. Do you guys agree with that, generally speaking? <laughs> yeah. Health and well-being. Details to follow, but, you know, <laughs> health and well-being. A lot of this kind of boils down to ways of viewing self. And we ask ourselves then, what ways of viewing the self, me, I might help one find grounding in reality and connection with others. So the assumption being that a grounding in reality would make one's expectations more reasonable and the subsequent choices more skillful. So whether we're talking about Buddhism or psychology, grounding in reality seems to be a component. Now what that reality is and how one grounds themselves is a huge conversation. But I think there is this assumption there that if we understand reality, whatever that is, our expectations are going to be a lot more reasonable. And then the choices we make in our life are going to be a lot more skillful. So, you know, it seems like common sense, but we're just kind of unpacking assumptions here. And then another assumption is that connection with others is a huge piece in feeling safety and contentment. Safety and contentment is somehow connected with connection with others. And that viewing the self, me, I in a correct way is going to somehow facilitate that connection with others. So here's some sort of, you know, assumptions we're starting with. If you look at this question, 
does a grounding in reality make one's expectations more reasonable and subsequent choices more skillful? Is a connection with others a huge piece in feeling safety and contentment? Do those two assumptions resonate with you? Does that seem like a big factor in terms of self-development or leading an intentional, effective life that is of benefit to humanity, or even just having one's own well-being, grounding in reality, connection to others? Would you add anything to that list? Things that might help happiness and well-being? <laughs> Things that psychology might help with or Buddhism might help with? What do we need for a meaningful life? What do we need for everyday stress relief? Yeah, these are the questions. These are the questions. So I think that, you know, I, I'm guessing there's no disagreement <laughs> that, that, you know, grounding in reality and connection with others are somehow a piece of the puzzle. Do you generally agree? Yeah. And then the question becomes, what are those things and how do we do it? Like, you know, I know these are big ideas to unpack in a short period of time, but, but I think it is worth kind of asking ourselves, what, what actually is the point of psychology and Buddhism? What is the point of any kind of self-help technique? Um, we just kind of dive into it thinking, I think it'll help something, but what exactly and how? You know, I think we need to make sure we're clear before we engage in either or both. So Buddhism and psychology both explore the self as a means to facilitate healthier relationships with identity, other individuals, and society as a whole. So for both, we ask, what is this self? And what does it mean to be in harmony with our, quote, authentic self? So for both of them, the self is a really important thing to explore. And... In that exploration, the assumption is that some of our suffering or all of our suffering comes from a misunderstanding of how the self relates to others, how the self relates to society, how supported that self feels, how connected that self feels. But we have to drill down into, well, what is it exactly? And here's where we start to get some, I guess, variation in view. So if you were to just ask yourself, based on life so far, based on things you've read, based on your education, what do you think psychology says is the self? Yeah, what would psychology say is the self, do you think? Just guessing. Or what does an integrated or an authentic self look like? What are some of the qualities? Yeah, the ego, identity popped into the chat. Yep, the self is something to do with the ego, something to do with identity, that's for sure, a psychology view. And we, we have kind of a rough idea of Freud, don't we? Um, you know, id, ego, super ego. We have a kind of a general, you know, working knowledge of these ideas. They've been around long enough. And, um, and Joanne was popping into the chat of, you know, a strong ego is a good thing, like a healthy ego, um, as opposed to like a fragile ego. Yeah. And I think when we hear words like authentic self, it feels like you've found something. Yeah, have you ever been listening to, I don't know, a TED Talk or Oprah Winfrey free special or you know something about self-development and they're talking about finding the authentic self or being the authentic self, almost as if you have to like uncover layers and then there it'll be fully formed and findable. Yeah. And there might be a connotation that it needs development or it needs um, added resources and supports to make it flourish. Or it might be like there is just some like quiet little identity resting there at your heart that's discoverable. You know, like it makes me feel like, you know, Transformers or something. There's a big giant robot and, and, and there's a little guy in the middle controlling the gears and stuff. I found him. There's the authentic self. Yeah. Or that the authentic self was some core personality patterns that you had in childhood and then got either encouraged or discouraged. And you're kind of going back to some sort of childhood self from an adult perspective. There can be some of those ideas. 
I think in psychology, there's a lot of conversation about what about the self is nature and what about the self is nurture. The explanation from psychology today about nature versus nurture. The expression nature versus nurture describes the question of how much a person's characteristics are formed by either nature or nurture. Nature means the innate biological factors, namely genetics, while nurture can refer to upbringing or life experience more generally. Traditionally, the nature versus nurture has been framed as a debate between those who argue for the dominance of one source of influence or the other, but contemporary experts acknowledge that both nature and nurture play a role in psychological development and interact in complex ways. You know, so nature in the sense of you were just born that way. You had no choice. That was just your wiring, your genetics, your everything, you know, your nervous system, your physiology. That's just who you are, nature. And then nurture being the way in which the conditions around you made that stronger or weaker, the way the conditions might have changed certain aspects. But there, and lots of forms of psychology believe that it's a combination of both nature and nurture is where the self arises from or what the self is. Yeah. And this nature nurture conversation is a good one. And there's really good points there. And I think it can be very useful for us to understand that, yes, physiologically, there are certain things about our brain that we were born with genetically. You know, Buddhism is all about science. We, we love science. So we're not saying that's not true. But what we're talking about is more duration and cause and effect. So we would say that the sperm and egg of your parents and all of your ancestors, of course, has a relationship to your brain now. Sure, absolutely. But why did you find those parents? And find, I say loosely, it's not like we chose them unless we're a very advanced practitioner. In Buddhism, we'll acknowledge things like genetic predispositions and things like certain kind of personalities and behaviors that are very hardwired but we don't think of it in the sense of, and therefore it is the self. We say hardwired means habitual. Genetic means strong conditions. And that actually the self is something far more subtle than that, but those things still have an influence and are important to acknowledge. Yeah. So we don't throw out the nature nurture question, we build on it. And I think with a lot of things, when we're talking Buddhism and psychology, we don't have to discard one in favor of the other. They can augment each other, but we need to be careful to not mix them and think that they're always talking about the same thing because often they're really not. So it's an inter, it's like an integration that you do internally between two schools of thought rather than taking the two schools of thought externally and mushing them together and now making them one thing. The integration has to be with yourself as an individual. Yeah. And I think it does a disservice to both traditions to try and mix them. Yeah. You, you sort of lose the power of each in some ways. If you pursue psychology and you then start to pull in Buddhist ideas of the mind and the self and reality, it can really help support the work. And if you practice Buddhism and you pull in ideas about habituation, ideas about how to break addictions, ideas about to find you know, safety and contentment and get your basic needs met, it can be really useful, but you don't wanna call one the other because the te techniques and goals are very different. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that that is generally evident as soon as you start to explore either, but there is a real trend in society to cherry pick what you like from all things and mush it together and make your own thing and then declare it under the heading of something that already existed, like to give it credibility. So rather than just saying, that's my inner work of integrating different ideas, you put it out there into the world and say, now that is Buddhism. And it's like, no, that's not Buddhism. It's some Buddhism, it's some psychology, it's some astrology, it's some fun anecdotes. It's some of this, it's some of that. Don't call it Buddhism. Yeah. But internally, that integration is very powerful. Yeah. 
So when we hear this authentic self question, you know, it, it comes up a lot in developmental stages. Like when you're a teenager, you're supposed to find yourself and then you realize you're actually building the self. Yeah, you're not finding anything. You're kind of deciding. Here's the characteristics. I'm going to keep the rest of my life, grow the rest of my life. It might not be a conscious choice, but, you know, in those early developmental years, certainly there are certain patterns that once we land on them, they do stay with us for the greater portion of our life, unless they're addressed. So that's fine to say, but it doesn't mean you found yourself, you built yourself. You might have found some pre-existing habits, you reinforced them and you kept them and it was how you were in past lives as well. But it becomes a really interesting question of who am I exactly? What is being found? So then when we're looking at Buddhism and the self, the danger is we skip over all of the work that psychology does so well in terms of accepting patterns. So I would say that that psychology doesn't go far enough. And I sometimes think that Buddhism jumps steps. So If you're kind of looking at, all right, in Buddhism, we talk about no self, meaning that there is no inherently existent self, no self that exists from its own side. And you go straight to that philosophical view without understanding that, relatively speaking, you have learning styles and personality types and ways of relating to the world that are very strong in you. They are not you, but they're here. So to not acknowledge them can kind of make you a little disjointed in your practice. It can make things a bit clunky and inefficient because you're skipping to the end of the story without looking at all the plot in between. And how, how do you actually get to that end? The end being liberation from the illusory self, liberation from the afflictions and negative emotions that come from believing in the illusory self, the expansion of the consciousness into its full development as a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient things, that end of the story is provocative and fascinating and inspiring. And you can't jump to the end. You can't just flip to the back of the book and be there. So when you're looking at parallels between Buddhism and psychology, there are some parallels with understanding personality. And there are some parallels with understanding parts of identity. It's just the main difference is in psychology, there's much more of an assumption that some components are innate. And in Buddhism, nothing is innate. It's just habitual. The only thing that's innate is your ignorance about that self. And that's removable. Yeah. So here's what we were talking about with psychology, that ways of viewing the self or me or I to help one find grounding in reality and connection with others. The idea common in many forms of psychology is thinking that the self is a result of both nature and nurture with elements that are changeable and elements that aren't. And so as a little baby, you've got some genetic predispositions and then the nurture is what brings them out and reinforces them or adds to them or detracts from them. But the baby is sort of like an undeveloped vessel, (laughs) right? Which has predispositions, but they haven't kind of come to light as of yet. And that there are many things that are like a blank slate. And from a Buddhist perspective, we would say there are lots of preconditions which are habits and they are in no way a clean slate. They come in with tons of karmic conditioning, tons of waves of habit, and all they have to do is for their body to grow for those things to show themselves. So that's an interesting thing to sit with. Then in Buddhism, the self is only that which is merely labeled on the collection of ever-changing body and mind. We say the five skandhas or aggregates. So there is nothing inherently me, self-created or self-existent. And everything depends on other factors to arise and exist. So there is no core self, but there is a self. That self is only which is labeled on the collection. That any more than that 
is an exaggeration. When we're talking about these these concepts of, you know, because I, I get the idea that that we're all of these elements is just like merely labeled. But then I get a bit confused by the idea and the concept of us having Buddha nature, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's supposed to be um, ever always there, you know, and, and so then I'm like, well, wait a second, that's confusing, because um, everything else is like kind of in movement, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I get a little confused around that. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Because Buddha nature kind of implies something innate and, you know, finished or ready to find like an authentic self, you know, like, oh, oh, there's the Buddha nature, Bing! you know, and um, in our tradition, we really describe Buddha nature as a potentiality that has two aspects. And there is an aspect which is not changing, which is permanent. But that unchanging permanent aspect isn't inherently existent. And so sometimes we equate the idea of permanent with inherent. For us, permanent just means not changing, but it doesn't mean like without parts or components or a basis to label. So the permanent aspect of Buddha nature is the fact that the mind is empty of inherent existence. But that mind that is empty of inherent existence changes moment to moment to moment. But the characteristic of it lacking inherence doesn't change. So it's kind of, it's like a a little bit of a confusing philosophical point, but I think if you sit with it, it kind of comes clear where this thing, the mind, like its relative nature is clarity and awareness. That's the relative oh. nature of the mind. The ultimate nature of the mind is that it lacks inherent existence. So the relative nature of the mind being clarity and awareness means that there is changing due to the objects it comes across. There is changing moment to moment based on the moments before. And that clarity and awareness doesn't mean accurate. <laughs> it just means an ability to observe and cognize like a mountain lake. And the mountain lake could be agitated and not reflect clearly, or the mountain lake could be still and reflect quite accurately, but that's all describing the relative aspect of the mind. And so ultimately the fact that it lacks inherence means that it can develop. And if it inherently existed, it would be just as it is, kind of causelessly. And then any kind of development would be impossible, even just our development in this life. So Buddha nature is tricky because it has these two components, that which is naturally present and that which needs to be developed. And so present needs to be developed. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. And so that's, that's essentially because it does depend that other aspect depends on causes and conditions to manifest and, or grow or be revealed because <laughs> it's yeah it's going in that direction in so many yeah. different ways yeah okay yeah going in that direction so I mean the analogies are, are easy if you read the Tathagata Garba by Maitreya um, he has nine analogies about Buddha nature but the easiest one I think is the idea that um, within the mind is like raw gold And the afflictions and negative emotions and bad habits are like dirt on top of the raw gold. And through purification, we get to the raw gold. But that raw gold is not formed. It still must be formed into a Buddha. So you can't hurt the gold. The gold is always perfect, but it's not finished. It's just hanging out there, ready to be made into something functional and useful for society, humanity, the greater good, whatever you want to say. And mm-hmm. yeah, and, and so it's, when we say Buddha nature, it's a tricky word because really Buddha potential is a better framing. But the nature part is to indicate that it will always be there until it's actualized. And that should be comforting for us that that's our nature, but it's our nature in terms of like our birthright or our potential, not who we already are. That helps a lot, the, yeah. that changing it to potential. That helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, Lee, did you want to add? 
Um, it reminds me of Om Mani Padme Om, the, the <laughs> seeing myself, <laughs> seeing uh, or being the, the gem. Om Mani Padme Om, does that have similar meaning? Om Mani Padme Hum um, is very much about tapping into that potential for sure. For sure. And the jewel is related to compassion. And um, in the Mani, Mani is jewel, meaning compassion. Padme is lotus, meaning wisdom. And Om is Buddhahood, fully formed, enlightened body, speech, and mind, and whom is may it take root in my heart. So by saying Om Mani Padme Hum, you are really saying that I do have wisdom, I do have compassion, integrating them, developing them, I will come to become a Buddha. I will fully develop those two and integrate those two. So certainly it's related, yeah, yeah. And we say it as a reminder, we say it as a purifier, we say it as a way to protect our mind from bad habits in the future. But from a secular perspective, it really is thinking about the good qualities you have right now can be grown. They can be grown, they can be developed, they can be integrated, and they can become the self. Yeah, that those two things can become the self and that all the things that are obstacles to that ignorance and anger and attachment and all of those negative states of mind, those are not you. They're removable. Yeah, and those good qualities are able to be developed. And that is fundamentally very good news. And, you know, different forms of psychology might say a person is innately animalistic or innately neutral or innately good, depending on your school of thought. In Buddhism, we would say the mind is neutral, but its potentiality has infinite positive potential. Yeah, so the mind is neutral right now, but it has an ignorance with it. And because of that ignorance with it at present, it causes trouble. It has bad habits, bad behaviors, etc. So that ignorance being removable doesn't mean now suddenly you're Buddha, you still need to develop. But it brings back that question of why do we seek health? Why do we seek happiness? Psychology will help with a certain degree of health and happiness. It'll help. But what do we want that for? Just to enjoy it and then die? Just to enjoy that and spread it to a couple of people in our lives? To feel stable enough to become ambitious to dominate something or to achieve something? Like, what, what do we want health and wellness for? Yeah, it, sometimes it's framed in psychology like that's the end in, in and of itself health and well-being. Then do whatever you want with your ambitions. And it could be that, you know, psychology is to help a CEO be more stable and happy. And from that stable, happy place, they keep building their empires because they haven't connected with empathy and compassion. But some schools of psychology say a sign of good mental health is increased empathy. So it depends on which school of thought you're talking about. But still the question remains, to what end? Yeah, what is the end goal? Is it a harmonious society? Is it the development of mankind? Is it some sort of, I don't know, utopian paradise where everyone is living in harmony? Is that part of the goal? Is there a goal? And in Buddhism, our goal is the great enlightenment. So everyone's enlightenment is our goal. And the only way we're gonna help with everybody's enlightenment is if we ourselves become a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So there's parallels, you know, but there's also some things that might be different in terms of duration of view or duration of goal, this life or many lives. But there's a way of viewing psychology through the lens of legacy, where you're really thinking about what's the long-term impact I want to have on society after I leave and not thinking about your personal future life, but the future lives of others who come after you. And that kind of altruism is incredibly important and I think is the result of good mental health. So, you know, just kind of playing with what is the goal? What is the purpose? What am I achieving this for? So these two views of the self, some parallels, some differences. Which one works for you? Completely personal. They might both work for you in different ways. Now I thought we would do maybe just a little short reflection.
um, not, not a, you know, strictly speaking meditation, but just a little reflection. So if you want to just get yourself into a posture that feels clear and stable, that is not going to encourage sleep. Nice straight back, grounding into your space. And you can think that you're doing this reflection as an exercise in self-knowledge. You can think that you're doing this reflection as an exercise in understanding humans in general and how to encourage health and well-being in all of them, including oneself. But it helps to decide why. Why will I reflect? And to make it something bigger than today, bigger than oneself. So make it really personal and ask yourself, what way of viewing the self, me, I, is going to help me find grounding in reality and connection with others. So first explore just the psychological view, thinking of my own self as the result of both nature and nurture with elements that are changeable and elements that aren't. Is there a value in sitting with that place? There are some things genetically that I just came in with, some predispositions, some tendencies. Maybe we have a belief in epigenetics. Maybe there's some family trauma that got passed down. And so some of our ways of communicating and relating to the world are in a way inherited. almost as if we had no choice but to think and feel in certain ways because of the legacy of our ancestors, the legacy of our biology, our DNA. And in resting in that idea, does it help you release guilt and shame around some ideas of yourself, which you've maybe found to be problematic or lacking. If you think about some of these things as just being nature, does it give yourself a gentler view? And then that other aspect of nurture, that this self that you have might also be the result of having been trained certain ways by society, by your family, by your culture. That the experiences in your life have colored the way you see the world. Maybe the type of education you've had, your exposure to ideas, your exposure to prejudices, the different friends and family who you converse with the most often. Are these all factors in this self? Does it help to acknowledge that?
Does that help your world make sense? And so within that nature and nurture, does it help to think that there are elements of this self that are changeable, that you can grow and develop and heal from? And that there are some elements that maybe you can't, that are too inborn, too genetic, too physiological. Just sit with the impact that those ideas have on your mind, that some parts of this self are changeable and some aren't. And then just shift to exploring the Buddhist view. So what does it do to your mind to think that my own self is only that which is merely labeled on the collection of ever-changing body and mind? There is nothing inherently me, self-created or self-existent, and that everything depends on other factors to arise and exist, including my own conception of self, including everything I think about my personality, abilities, traits. Absolutely everything is dependent on other. Countless factors. Does this way of thinking help you have grounding in reality? Does it help with your connection to others? And so here the self is labeled on an aspect that is physical and is also labeled on an aspect that is not physical, the mind. The mind not being the same thing as the brain, but of course using the brain. And so because the mind uses the brain, there is certain conditions like genetics, etc., that have an influence. But this mind will not always be in this body. This body also changes. Even in this life, something like every seven years, all of the cells are replaced. We understand about things like neuroplasticity. We understand about things like the mind being able to be trained. So whether it's from a physical standpoint of the brain or a Buddhist standpoint of the non-physical mind, we know that change is possible. But from a Buddhist view, that change can be complete perfection into enlightenment meaning that there is no more suffering, none whatsoever. No more afflicted behaviors, no jealousy, no pride, no attachment and objectification of others, no anger and wish to harm of others. And the qualities like compassion, 
loving kindness, wisdom, completely developed into even omniscience. And so these goals feel very far away. And yet we do see that the mind can change. We do see that habits can be increased or decreased based on how much repetition, how many reinforcing factors. And would you say that the self you have now is exactly the same as the self of your childhood? There might be some traits that are similar, but are you the same person? That little one in the photo album And so just think of the four possibilities. Is it helpful to think of my own self as the result of both nature and nurture with elements that are changeable and elements that aren't? Or is it more useful uh, to think of my own self as that which is only and merely labeled on the collection of ever-changing body and mind? Or for me, is it useful to think of both of these integrating them in some way? Or are neither of these ways useful for me? Some other possibility of looking at the self is better. Which of these resonates the most for you? And whether you have a strong conclusion or it's still up in the air, just land on this idea today and in the future, what ways of thinking will help grow compassion for both myself and others in such a way that I'm energized by the idea of self-exploration being of benefit. Okay, you can. So you don't have to have a firm conclusion. It's, these are ideas that are really worth playing with. I think that if we are Dharma students for a long time, we know how we're supposed to think about this. And if we've been influenced by, Buddha, by psychology for a long time, we know how we're supposed to think about this. And you actually don't have to race to the ends. You know, just kind of like hold open the question with creativity. Because if you think about your personal life and your relationships with one another, sometimes it helps to think, this is just who I am. That is just who they are. And sometimes it helps to think, this is just who I am so far. This is just who they are so far. <laughs> and sometimes it helps to think, that is not me. That is not them. Depending on the context, depending on the conflict, depending on the connection, Many ways of thinking can help and relative tools can help make the relative world easier. But as our deepest project, we wanna ask what's the deepest, most confronting, most profound psychology that will fundamentally uproot my negative habits and negative states of mind. 
So that's the ongoing deeper thought project. But in terms of your daily life, let it be flexible, which tools make sense in which moments. And I think then as time goes by, your own personal philosophy becomes more enriched, more in depth, and you know the place from which you can connect with others and connect with reality. But, you know, don't force it just because you know where you're supposed to go with it. You know, let each moment be creative and be in alignment with the wisdom that you have so far. Because have you found this? Sometimes you feel like you're forcing yourself to believe something that you're not quite in resonance with yet. And that dissonance actually makes it harder to communicate with the person in front of you or to your own self. Yeah, so just kind of, and it's scary. It's groundless to have that kind of flexibility that says, some days I'm going to think this is just who I am. Some days I'm going to think this is just who I am so far. Some days I'm going to think this is not me at all. And then some days I'm going to go even deeper and go, what is me? You know, and to have the flexibility to explore the impact of each of those thoughts. It can, it's a brave stance. It can be unsettling. Yeah, Christina, go ahead. Well, first of all, everything thing you're saying is very helpful. So thank you, um, especially kind of given the uh, openness of like however wor however is working best for you to be beneficial to others and for yourself. Like so, that's really nice. But I, I what comes up for me is the what was a little triggering and, and confusing for me is the idea of with the Buddhist side of uh, concepts of that we're not in, we're not creating anything from our own side. And so I know this is a very debatable point in regards to karma. If, you know, if it's all kind of all predetermined, or if we are at a point where we have a, a choice, right. Where there's a spark of a moment where we have a choice, where we're creating in some essence, like a part of what we're creating to change our karma or to create different karma and so on and so forth. So I was wondering if that was just my own projection onto this whole idea of it just being like, I have no uh, pa power in creating of my own karma. That was a little triggering for me. Yeah. I was like, oh, wait, am I, am I not supposed to think like that? Is that me taking the psychology side of things and um, implying that uh, uh, um, applying that to Buddhism? Because I thought, and I, I know it's a debatable uh, point, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, to say that the self is not self-creating means that it's not inherently self-creating. Oh, like there's okay. not like a little core guy that is saying, now I shall gather this and I shall gather this and I shall gather this. You know, it's not self-creating or spontaneously creating or self-sufficient and substantially existent. But we ask ourselves then, is there free will or not? And is there choice or not? And we say, of course, there's free will, of course, there's choice, just not inherently. And the problem is, is that we often think that all choices are made alone. And, you know, that's not the way the world works. Even the choice to have the thoughts that you're having right now are influenced on the people in the Zoom room and what I'm saying and where my words came from and what temperature it is and how much you've eaten and all these things. So you're deciding, deciding what ideas to engage with and believe and take on board and which ideas you're choosing to discard and put aside or revisit. These are choices that you're making, but you're not making them alone. You know, you're not making them from your own side, independent of causes. That makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and karma is not fate, of course, um, and it's not predetermination, of course, but it can feel that way. But it's only in the sense of very strong habits are hard to break, but they can be broken. But it can start to feel like this is just inevitable what's happening in this relationship or this dynamic. It's just inevitable. This is just my karma. And it's, it's not so simple as that. It just feels that way because of how strong the habituation is. We keep watering similar seeds. But we can water different ones and our experience would change radically. It's just hard to make the shift whether it's a quote cognitive shift or it's a mental training to choose to water different seeds. 
even in terms of the secular environment, you know, they talk about how strong neural pathways are and the neural pathways very much influence the way we view reality and view each other. But new neural pathways can be made even as adults, even as very old adults, not quite as easily as baby brains, but we can do it. It just takes repetition of the new so consciously, so intentionally. And then it's as if you've changed your fate or changed your karma because you've changed the wiring, you know? And so I think you just keep playing back and forth with, there are things that I need to change. Some things I'm putting a lot of effort into changing and change is not gonna happen overnight because it took me a long time to get this way. You know, who, lo- who knows how many lifetimes I've been like this, whatever like this is but it doesn't have to feel like forever. But th- doesn't it mean that if there's, um, if, if there's uh, nothing is inherent, right? It's all empty from its own side and it's all merely labeled. Couldn't we then spontaneously be enlightened if we were actually able to release, let go of all of the labels and those holdings? If we were able to release all of those labels and those holdings, right? <laughs> but the, the question is, how do you do that genuinely? You know, you could in this moment say, I'm going to choose to call these flowers trumpets. I could do that. But that's not in alignment with relative truth. And this whole question of how we view relative truth and ultimate truth, it's so delicate because we're not negating one for the other. But relative truth is by nature deceptive. It's a deceptive truth. The deception is that it seems to exist from its own side. Like these seem to be inherently existent flowers, but relatively they are flowers. It's just the seeming is deceptive. They seem to just be there obviously as if there is no choice, but to label them this way, you know? And when we were a little kid, we didn't know what flowers were, you know, other species don't know what that is. Some it's food, some it's poison, some it's indifferent, some don't notice, you know, like it's not inherently that, but the seeming is that things are just as they seem. And that is the influence of grasping at inherent existence. And so the the main thing is that for the self, it feels like this is the inevitable conclusion, (laughs) you know, or like this is the inevitability of myself, you know, oh, well, here it is what it is, eh, you know, and um, maybe there's some perfected version we could come to, but it's somehow a core, identity that's findable and it's not actually findable so you're trying to find the non-finding of the inherently existent self because there is no inherently existent self but there is a relative self which is just labeled on the collection so it's so tricky isn't it the relative self is just that which is labeled on the body and mind And that feels comfortable and stable until you start to ask, what is the body and mind labeled on? The body is labeled on what? And you're like, here, here. And you're like, no, that's your cheek. That's not your body. That's a piece, you know? Okay, the mind. What about the mind? Uh, Which part of the mind? Yesterday's mind, today's mind, breakfast mind, lunch mind, you know, which mind? The happy one, the sad one, the mean one, the kind one, the, the urge to move towards certain objects or away from others the part that describes, the part that feels, you know? And so each component that we label self on has components to label that component on infinitely, which doesn't mean nothingness. But the nothingness is the lack of inherence, the absence of inherence. It's not the absence of existence. And that's where sometimes we get confused in Buddhism. So yes, you are creating your own reality through your mind. You're just not self-existently creating your own reality, (laughs) right? You're influentially, yes, you're being influenced. So anyway, it's just an hour public talk. So it's food for thought and um, follow-ups as the time goes by. So thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, We will be holding this again at the beginning of next um, month. Um, um, we will be doing um, some more uh, secular talks and this, the first Sunday in December and the first Sunday in uh, January as well. And I will put the link um, in the page really quick before if you'd like to have access to that quickly. And thank you again, Venerable Yuntin, for all that you do.
it's amazing to have uh, the teachings that you're able to share in such a, um, you have profound concepts and you simplify it for people like myself that have a more difficult time with such profound concepts. <laughs> so thank you.